2001 Maniacs is one of those movies for me that falls in line with the typical early 2000s rabble we were seeing, like the Wrong Turn franchise or the House of a Thousand Corpses. Or so I thought, until I actually decided to sit down and rewatch this movie, that by the end, left me feeling like the people out there who consider 2001 Maniacs to be some sort of cod classic, must be some sort of maniacs of their own. Because this movie is certainly, uh, something. And one of those things being a remake of the 1964 movie 2000 Maniacs. But we're here for the early 2000s comedy horror cheese, not that 60s cheese. It smells funny. The movie begins with a group of friends, Nelson, Anderson and Corey, heading down to Daytona Beach for spring break. This trio of friends being the typical unfunny early 2000s walking cliché of college dude bros who really love the meat sacks attached to women's chests. After absolutely obliterating Eli Roth's pet armadillo for some extra XP, unfortunately not obliterating that absolutely egregious soul patch in the process, the group meet three other college students, Ricky, Joey and Kat, as they're stopped at a gas station having their free meal removed from their car. And now that we've been introduced to our main cast of characters, we can sit back and relax and wait patiently for them to all be horrifically unalived. And while we're patiently waiting, I'll plug my clothing brand, Morbid Minds, run by me and my wife. We've got some awesome new horror-related designs coming soon, so stay tuned for that and consider checking it out with the link in the description or in the pinned comment. After all agreeing to meet up at the beach later, they quickly find themselves at not the beach, as being stopped by a sign and sent on a detour, because apparently they just couldn't possibly say no to a piece of wood. After driving through this rather funny looking beach, the three guys end up in the town of Pleasant Valley, a town that could only be described as pleasant if the idea of taking a dump in the woods appeals to you. They drive right into the middle of the town's guts and glory jubilee, that sounds like the title of a snuff film, who are quickly surrounded by a large group of cheery locals, who apparently took the idea of southern hospitality and decided that a flash mob would do better. They're welcomed by Robert England's character Mayor Buckman sporting a confederate flag eye patch. And unfortunately for him, the only thing he'll be seeing out of that eye is black. Ricky, Joey and Cat then arrive, confused that the only beach that they can see is this son of a beach spouting all his yeehaw stuff, quickly followed by Malcolm and Leah, a biker couple that we've never met before because the movie decided at last minute it didn't have quite enough characters to kill and it was beginning to look awfully white in here to the point where my retinas were starting to burn, with everyone arriving awfully conveniently within the span of about 30 seconds and then deciding to stay for the festivities because beach booze and chicks is clearly outweighed by damp forest moonshine and the possibility of inbreeding. Nelson, Anderson and Corey, being fanned by some local women, spot someone running out of the bushes chasing after a sheep with their trousers around their ankles, because nothing beats a good lamb chop. Ricky, Joey and Kat are then introduced to someone named Harper, as he takes Kat away from the friend group on a private tour. A private tour of each other's bodies apparently, as neither of them waste any time getting intimate with each other. Well, when in Georgia I guess. It's just that what Harper prefers is on the inside. Literally. He decides to get intimate with Kat one piece at a time. And by that, I mean he attaches all of her arms and legs to a rope and has four horses violently tear her apart. Like some kind of gooey flesh-filled piñata. Well, when in Georgia. Anderson, Corey and Nelson then meet one of the locals named Hucklebilly and he invites the trio to join him for a nice friendly game known as Hang the Neighbourhood Cat. Not the type of pussy these guys had in mind for their spring break. Later that night, all of the guests, Mayor Buckman and his wife Granny Boone, are all gathered around the dinner table with not one of them seeming the slightest bit concerned as to where Cat and all of her four limbs have gotten off to. Well that way and that way, that's where her limbs have gotten off to. And we see that Ricky is actually quite the fan of eating ass, and by that I mean unbeknownst to him he's quite literally eating her ass cheek, but at least he's well mannered enough to use a knife and fork when consuming human rectum remains. Wouldn't want to be rude now. Anderson and Joey, using their tongues as dental floss, are helping to get the little bits of cats out of each other's teeth. And then absolutely everyone but Nelson has someone to take back to their room for the night, with Ricky taking Buckman's son Rufus back to play a nice friendly game of tickle each other's insides. And Nelson gets to know his anime waifu pillow, when suddenly he hears someone calling to him from outside of the window. He invites her up after she offers him her, uh, jug. Just the singular though. And after coming up to his room, Nelson rather rudely wets the bed as the woman forces a tube into his mouth that pushes acid into his stomach, which makes a rather big mess in the process as it proceeds to burn a hole right through his insides and then through the mattress. You know what they say? 
Any holds a goal? The next morning, the Jubilee celebrations begin. So they decide to celebrate this momentous occasion by hacking up body parts in a cabin and using the severed heads for target practice at a game of horseshoes that neither Malcolm, Anderson or Ricky seem to realise. Because apparently that round head-shaped thing over there, with what appears to be covered in human hair, is indeed a mink. Huh, you learn something new every day. Leah and Ricky are dancing with Granny Boone and some of the local women as Granny does her best chicken impression, when suddenly she decides that they're having a little bit too much fun and thinks things would be a little bit better if Leah got her bell rung. And by that, I mean they place her beneath a large bell and play the human equivalent of whack-a-mole and drop it on her. Ricky takes off running into the woods, but ends up running directly into Rufus, who apparently didn't appreciate not being called the next morning, and takes Ricky right back into the town. They bend Ricky over a table and force a rod through his backside until it makes its way out of his front side, creating Rufus's favourite snack in the process, a Ricky shish kebab. And at the saloon with the survivors, Joey, Anderson, Corey and Malcolm, who don't actually realise they're survivors, they're starting to realise that things here aren't quite as they seem, so they decide to hatch a plan to get out of here, but are almost immediately confronted by Mayor Buckman, who insists that the group stay for a barbecue, so they pretend to go along with it. Not realising that staying for the barbecue meant being cooked on the barbecue. Malcolm, strolling through the woods, comes across a small child keeping themselves entertained by crushing a mouse to death in a vice, before seeing who he thinks is Leah running off into the woods. Yeah, Leah, if she suffered from a severe hemorrhoid problem. He eventually manages to catch up to Leah, for it then to be revealed that it was just somebody cosplaying as Leah and suffering from severe hemorrhoids, before being grabbed from behind and hit over the head with a guitar because screw music. Malcolm wakes up, restrained to a table with a rather nasty headache because someone used his skull to play smoke on the water, when suddenly, the locals begin turning a device that begins to lower a large slab down onto his torso that crushes him to the point that his eyeballs pop out of their sockets like some kind of demented fidget toy. Corey and Joey, still unaware to the atrocities that are currently being committed, are attempting to sneak back into the house, but notice that Rufus has collected all of their items and is leaving. Hoping that he didn't find his cell phone, Corey decides to check the bedroom, while Joey, seemingly in a completely different building to the ones containing said bedrooms, decides to stay back and keep a lookout. Not really sure what her plan is, to be honest. Make a bird call if she notices something. It's no problem anyway, as after finding the snack cupboard full of jars containing various different body parts labelled by year, Joey falls for the old trick known as bad dude standing behind a door and is taken away. After getting to the bedroom, Corey finds Peaches, one of the local women in his room, in possession of his cell phone. She removes his trousers and sits him down onto the chair, but just before she can get started, she gets jealous after noticing him texting someone else, so decides that an appropriate response to this would be to put on some demonic looking metal teeth and finish him off. And by finish him off, I mean bite it off. Anderson comes across the glory hole created by Nelson and sees Ricky staring at him through a nearby window before watching him back up into the house. After entering the building and accidentally kicking the rod used on Ricky, he gets distracted by looking at a plate of fruit because he enjoys the simple things in life and doesn't seem to notice Ricky's body behind him as two men come through the door and block it from being seen. They tell him where to find his car because I guess they offer a five-star valet system here in Pleasant Valley, but instead of finding his car, he finds Hucklebilly and two women armed with a shotgun. In other words, a really weird party. He's knocked unconscious by Hucklebilly's apparent super strong slingshot and wakes up later that night, more than likely suffering from some sort of serious brain damage as I don't think it's safe to be unconscious for that amount of time. To see Buckman leaning over him, looking like he's about to come in for a nice big sloppy kiss and Joey restrained at the bottom of him. Buckman, knowing that everyone loves a bit of head from time to time, unveils the main course to reveal several plates containing the heads of their friends. Well. Former friends, I guess. But instead of just killing Anderson when he clearly can, Buckman offers him a chance to live. But to be given the chance, he needs to kill Joey. So he agrees. And just like that, they untie and hand the man whose friends they've just brutally unalived and eaten the cleaver, which unsurprisingly gets immediately launched at Buckman. He dodges it, but the blade finds itself lodged into the chest of his son Rufus, so Anderson kicks over a pot to start a fire, and Buckman takes him on with a sword, like some kind of overzealous larper who's had one too many cans of Red Bull. Using a serving dish lid, Anderson's able to block the attacks and tackle Buckman to the floor. They fight back and forth for the sword, like siblings fighting back and forth for the TV remote, and much like siblings fighting for the TV remote, Buckman thrusts the sword into Anderson, but then quickly tells him to be quiet, otherwise mum will hear. But despite it clearly making a flesh-piercing sound, 
Trust me, I'm an expert on that. It's then revealed that Buckman missed, and using the severed head of one of his friends as a shield, Anderson blocks the sword again and pulls off Buckman's eye patch to be greeted to the sight of hundreds of maggots falling towards his face. And after holding a fork to Buckman's non-maggoty eye, he agrees to let the pair leave as long as he spares his eye. So they both get on Malcolm's motorcycle and drive from the town and off into the night. After barging into a police station and almost getting shot, they tell the officer what's just happened to them. But not really believing their story from the get-go, the officer drives them out to Pleasant Valley to reveal that the whole area is nothing but a war cemetery dedicated to the town that was ransacked by Northerners back in the Civil War. Damn Northern Vikings back at it again. And after finding a headstone that indicates Buckman's been long dead, reading the quote, never will they rest until one for one they are avenged, Anderson pays his respects by spitting on the grave and walking away. So as the pair are riding away, confused and frightened by their recent run-in with Confederate zombie ghost creatures, don't have long to ponder it after driving directly through a strip of barbed wire and accidentally dropping their heads on the floor. Hucklebilly picks up their heads and walks off down the road and vanishes as the movie comes to an end. Leaving me wishing that I could vanish into thin air too, as I sit here questioning what it was that I just watched, wondering why is it that Buckman keeps all of those maggots in his skull? Is it a protein thing? And before we finish up, I'd just like to quickly remind you guys about my clothing brand, Morbid Minds. If you see anything on screen here that tickles your fancy, maybe consider clicking the link and going to check it out. And I'd like to give a big thank you to all of my YouTube members too. A big thank you to Grumpy Old Man, Laurie Resendez, Tony Kidson, Cal Ballinger, Billy Bad Cables, Gary Braunbeck, and Psycho. And while I'm at it, I'd also like to give a big thank you to all of my patrons too. So a big thank you to Dom, Hunters263, Rebecca Pitts, A Dandy in Space, Martin Brannan, Natasha Twyman, Jared C. Bees, Pascal Mathis, Fighting the Pirates, Richard McGowan III, Macy J, Chris, Dennis, Wade Knott, Ashley L. Wintz, Christopher Butsky, Joshua Torres, Remy, Fire Goes Fast, Josh Brooks, Dyreem, Robert Zerweck, Dark Shiva, Josh Hannon, Billy Whitaker, Axel Not Chicken Imp, Lonif, Jay Slows, Daniel Dickinson, Donnie Do Work, G Source, Fatty Ghost, Miguel, Owen, Curtis Mia, Mackenzie Riley, Reese Knight Cole, Louisa Floyd, Dwayne Nix, Bryson, Cody Gwynn, John Smith, Madrick, Andrew Miranda, and Scott Sherberger. So once again, a big thank you to all of my YouTube members and Patreons, and thank you to everyone else for watching.